Welcome to the last unit of AP Biology, which is Unit 8, Ecology. In this video, we're going to cover um, an introduction to ecology and then move into 8.1, Responses to the Environment, and 8.2, Energy Flow Through Ecosystems. So as an introduction, if we're talking about ecology, let's make sure we know at the basic level what we're talking about. So let's define ecology. Ecology is how organisms relate to one another and to their physical surroundings. Reminder that organisms goes beyond animals. It's plants, it's bacteria, it's fungi, um, and then it's the relationships within those, between those organisms um, of the same species and of other species, as well as to the physical surroundings, so abiotic factors as well. We're going to look at three different areas of ecology. We're going to look at behavioral ecology, population ecology, and community ecology. To um, understand this, what we're doing here is we're looking at sort of an individual level, and then we're going to be looking at a population, which is all the organisms of the same species, and then we're going to be looking at a community, which is a group of varied species. So we're going to start with behavioral ecology. What is that? That's the study of evolutionary basis for behavior due to ecological pressures. So in this case, we're looking at a wolf. Ask a question about the behavior depicted in this photo that could be answered through a scientific study. Now there are many, many questions you might have asked. Um, for example, you might have asked, why is this wolf jumping? Um, you might have also asked, how is this wolf able to jump? The how and the why are two really common categories of question types. Now you don't need to memorize everything in this table, but I do want you to understand that you can look at behaviors from various perspectives. You can look at um, the mechanisms, that's the how, and then you can also look at the, um, the function of it, the why. And for each of those, you can look at different time scales. You can look at a more immediate question of what's the immediate trigger of this response, or what's the benefit of this response in the here and now, or you can take a more long-term approach. You can look at um, triggers that go back in an organism's lifetime, Maybe what they were doing earlier that day had an effect. Maybe it's something even earlier in their lifetime. Maybe it's something during development. Um, the same thing with function. You can go back in time, even in evolutionary time. So what might be the evolutionary history of a trait? Again, you don't need to memorize all of these, but I do want you to understand that any individual behavior can be approached from studying it from a lot of different perspectives. Let's just practice that to make sure you understand the concepts without worrying too much about um, these exact definitions. So here we see a fiddler crab waving its claw. Um, let's try to figure out um, some explanations for this behavior that would fit in these four different categories. So one possible explanation is adult male claw wave, uh, adult males claw wave while juveniles and females do not. Another explanation is visual stimulus of a male is processed in the brain and leads to a neural signal which causes muscle contraction. Another explanation is that claw waving repels other males and attracts females. And the final explanation, of, among many, is that many species of fiddler crabs wave their claws but do so in different patterns. Now recognize that these are all correct explanations of the behavior, but they're just looking at different aspects of the behavior. So see if you can match these up to this table. So here's the answer. If we're looking at a stimulus and response, that's thinking about the mechanism in the here and now. If we're looking at development, that's looking at how is this happening, what's the trigger, but on a longer time scale. The here and now function, the question of why might this crab be doing this, um, we could explain that as claw waving repels other males or attracts females. And then we could look over evolutionary time, looking at um, comparing different species of crab and their behaviors. Let's dig into that stimulus response aspect, so those proximate questions um, relating to the mechanism of it. So organisms, including plants, prokaryotes, etc., can detect a wide variety of stimuli and respond in a variety of ways. What are some categories of stimuli that organisms can detect, and what are some categories of responses? So when we're talking about detecting stimuli, that stimuli could be internal to the organism or external, and it could be abiotic or biotic. So it could relate to um, something outside of their, of their body related to the sunshine, 
and temperature. It could relate to other organisms. It could relate to something going on internally, hormone levels, um, solute levels. Um, so all of these stimuli can uh, cause different responses in an organism. And those organisms can respond both phys physiologically by sort of changing internal um, levels of hormones and heart rate, things like that, as well as behaviorally, so sort of actions that it can take outside of itself. Stimuli and responses include intraspecific and interspecific communication. And as a reminder, intraspecific means within the same species, and interspecific means outside of the species. Many traits related to an organism's ability to detect important stimuli and respond appropriately are heritable and under the influence of natural selection. So this is where evolution and ecology, well, evolution and ecology come together in many ways, but recognize that behavior in many cases um, is under the influence of natural selection. Complex responses, such as cooperative behavior, can sometimes but not always increase fitness. So really any behavior is similar to um, any other trait that um, originally the, the variation is going to be caused um, by mutations or by um, sort of the interaction between the organism and a new environment. And in some cases that can increase fitness, and in some cases it can have a neutral effect in some cases, it can actually decrease fitness, and natural selection will be able to operate on those as long as it's um, heritable and variation exists. All right, let's talk about energy for a moment. Life requires energy. All of the processes that our cells are um, going through require energy. So that includes um, maintaining cellular and molecular organization, growing, reproducing. Organisms differ in how they gain and use their energy. Describe the energy acquisition strategies shown in these pictures. The ones on the left are both considered autotrophs, which are um, organisms that can produce their own food. These are producers. On the left, we see an example of organisms that are capturing energy from light. So plants, for example, are photosynthetic. There are organisms that are able to capture energy from small inorganic molecules in the absence of oxygen even. These are chemosynthetic. Um, and so this is often going to be happening um, sort of in deep sea vents, places like that, other places as well. But this is a, a, common where, a common location where you'd find chemosynthetic organisms. Heterotrophs cannot produce their own food. These are considered consumers. Um, so this is like us, for example. Um, animals are heterotrophs. Heterotrophs capture energy produced by other organisms. Lipids, proteins, carbohydrates can all be metabolized via hydrolysis. And for more on that, go back to that very first unit um, of biochemistry, as well as the unit on energy to, to remind yourself of more of those processes. It's important to recognize that not all of the energy captured by the producers is available to the consumers. Why not? And that's because the energy that the producers are capturing is used by the producers. Um, and the, that means that the grass itself that's taking in that sunlight is using some of that energy itself. So that means that um, when an elk is eating the grass, it's not going to get 100% of that energy that came from the sun. Um, changes in energy availability can result in disruptions to the ecosystem, which means if there is less energy available to the producers, that's going to have a sort of trickle up effect where it means there will be less energy available for those consumers. There's a um, rule, and I say a quote unquote rule because it's not a hard and fast rule, but you'll sometimes hear people talk about the 10% rule, which is in many cases, only about 10% of the energy travels up to the next trophic level, the next energy level. Now that is not always exactly true. There's a whole lot of factors that can affect that, um, but I just want you to be aware that we're talking about like sort of on that 10% scale, that it's um, most energy actually doesn't make it up to the next trophic level. Organisms also differ in not only how they take in their energy, but also how they use their energy. Take a look at these pictures and see if you can figure out how these organisms differ in how they use their energy. 
The organism on the left, the fish, is an ectotherm. Ectotherms do not have efficient internal mechanisms to maintain body temperature. They can change their behavior to modify their temperature, you know, move to somewhere warmer or to somewhere sunny, um, but internal mechanisms do not produce adequate heat to maintain a, a stable body temperature. Endotherms use thermal energy de generated by metabolism to maintain homeostatic body temperatures, which means regardless of what the temperature is on the outside of their body, it tends to stay pretty balanced on the inside. Energy is really important to talk about because organisms are, their lives are dependent on having adequate energy. If there's net gain of energy, they take in more than they're using, that results in energy storage or growth. If you have net loss over time, that can result in loss of mass and, of, and ultimately death. So energy balance can dictate how much energy organisms devote to survival versus reproduction. If an organism is right on that edge where it's really not taking in much energy, it's, it's likely to be devoting more of its energy to just staying alive, to maintain those basic homeostatic processes and not put much energy into reproduction. Organisms differ in how much energy they use. Now, ectotherms that don't regulate their body temperature um, through metabolic processes generally use quite a bit less energy than endotherms. But here we have pictured two different endotherms. So both are um, maintaining their body temperature um, through metabolic processes. Which animal do you think is going to have the higher metabolic rate? So which one is going to be using up energy faster? The elephant is going to be using a lot more energy than the mouse um, per unit time um, because it has so many more cells to support. It's just so much bigger, there are so many more cells that need to be keeping, um, keeping going, um, that the elephant is going to be using a lot more energy. However, if you look at gram per gram, you look at a gram of the mouse and a gram of the elephant, the gram of the mouse is actually going to be using energy a lot faster. So smaller organisms um, are going to be using energy at a faster rate than larger organisms per unit mass. And remember, we're talking about within endotherms. Ectotherms use quite a bit less energy. That's where we're going to leave it off for right now. This was units 8.1, responses to the environment, and 8.2, looking at energy flow.